Here where the waters of the Zambezi form a frontier between Zambia and Zimbabwe, they also form the final line of defence in a bitter war. And if that war is lost, the forces of conservation in Africa will have suffered an ignominious and final defeat. For down there in the Zambezi Valley is the very last large and viable population of black rhino still living in its natural habitat. Now it too is under attack. Elsewhere in Africa, in Uganda, Tanzania, Kenya and the Central African Republic, where up until the 1970s there were 60 to 70,000 rhino, the animal has virtually been wiped out, reduced to a miserable rump population clinging to survival in fenced and guarded enclosures. For the African rhino, the 1970s was a decade of disaster. In a microsecond of geological time, an animal that has wandered the earth for 60 million years enduring every kind of natural catastrophe, has, by a handful of cruel and greedy men, been brought to the brink of destruction. Cruelty and greed are the twin signatures on the death warrant of this vulnerable and endearing animal. Our most ancient mammal has been hunted almost to extinction because of the wholly artificial value placed on its horn. Behind locked doors and armed guards in a storeroom in Zimbabwe's capital, Harare, is the grisly evidence of the poacher's work. The animals are killed and their horns cut off and sold for ornamental dagger handles and for oriental medicine. Every horn stored here was confiscated from armed poachers who crossed from Zambia and infiltrated into the Zambezi Valley, risking even death to obtain what must be by now the world's most highly priced natural product. In these two sacks is rhino horn worth 1.8 million US dollars, blood money that purchased the death of 16 black rhino. Here we have a 37 uh, kilogram tusk, the value of which is $15,000. And by comparison, to give you some idea of equivalent, here we have a 1.5 kg rhino horn, um, the value of which is $15,000, equivalent to uh, the elephant tusk. And you can see how easy it is to move rhino horn, um, being so small and light as compared to an equal valued elephant tusk. Vanity and superstition have been the death of Africa's rhinos. This horn was destined for two markets, for the oil-rich countries of the Middle East, where every macho youth wants a ceremonial dagger with a rhino horn handle, or to the Far East, where it's ground down and used as medicine. And this despite the fact that rhino horn is nothing but matted hair, with about the same medical properties as chewed fingernails. To discourage this shameful trade and save the remaining rhino, Zimbabwe is now fighting back. In early 1985, the Wildlife Department launched Operation Stronghold with two main objectives, to kill or capture the poachers and to move the remaining rhino population to safer areas, far from the nation's frontiers. For three years now, Clem Kutsi has been leading the efforts to capture and translocate as many rhino as possible as quickly as possible. Kutsi is an incredibly tough 53-year-old. In the past 20 years, he's tracked, captured and translocated everything from buffalo to crocodiles. Today, he's in radio contact with a light aircraft, which is doing some of the tracking for him. A small bag of wood ash helps him to stay upwind of the rhino. While Kutsi and his team have managed to take 110 animals to safety, the poachers have slaughtered 200. So it's a battle against time, which at present he's in danger of losing not only because of the poachers, but because of a shortage of equipment and funds. Only a special grant authorised by Prime Minister Mugabe himself has made it possible for this work to continue until the last moment before the rains make the land impossible. My main tracker is Maxon. He is a really fantastic tracker and has been doing it for many years. 
Well, I've never yet had Maxon leave me in the ledge. Whatever difficulty we've got into, he's stuck with me and uh, seen it through. Clem is almost near enough to take a shot, but not quite. With such thick tree cover, it's not easy to find a clear field of fire. It's important that the dart strikes the large areas of muscle tissue and not bone or vital organs. Should he miss, then Doug Evans must be in position to take a second shot, the very least precaution. Faced with an enraged rhino, even the strongest men turn pale. The message goes out to Barney O'Hara in the spotter plane above that the rhino has been successfully darted. His job is to follow the fleeing animal until the drug takes effect and to pinpoint where it finally collapses. Guided by the plane, Clem and his rangers will reach the immobilized animal as quickly as they can, lest by ill chance it's fallen in such a way as to suffocate or drown. I feel for any animal that is under threat, but I have a very special feeling for the black rhino because it is a prehistoric animal. If the present trend continues, it will lead to the elimination of a very special species. On your left, but on your nose, over. OK, your left wing is over us now. Right, bring some ointment as well. Confirm he's number 13, eh? Um, yeah. Oh, look at that again, eh? Look at it. Only a third of that drug. A faulty dart has failed to deliver its full dose of tranquilizer, and the rhino may come round before the truck arrives to collect it. Every captured rhino is systematically processed, inoculated against disease, ear notched, tagged, and measured. Okay, do it. Measurements that indicate, among other things, that the horns on this one animal would be worth 45,000 US dollars if they ever fell into the hands of the poacher. But with luck, they won't. Even now, the plane is guiding in the truck Barney, that will Doug. take the rhino to a place of safety. Yeah, Barney, Barney, Doug. Confirm it's about, still about five k's to the truck before it gets to us. OK, finally, 253. To evacuate one black rhino demands a commitment of sweat and toil and determination that cannot be overstated. Hacking their way through five kilometers of bush, Clem's rangers work in oppressive heat intensified by the approaching rains, and encounters with lion and leopard are not unknown. But the gravest hazard must be the chance of meeting poachers, many now armed with automatic weapons, and all prepared to shoot their way out of trouble. Yeah, OK. Um, he's running a bit hot. He wants to go and land. Yeah, yeah OK. Give him a good direction. Huh? Go back once you give the truck a good direction and land and have a look over. Barney O'Hara is a flyer who shares Clem's total commitment to the salvation of the rhino. But commitment alone is not enough. After six months' intensive flying, day in, day out, the little Piper Super Cup is hardly airworthy. Barney's been aloft for more than four hours, which involves a whole range of pressures, both mental and physical. Oh. Barney, I wonder if you could just show us um, your flying kit and your maintenance room here. Yeah, sure. Um, well, there's not a hell of a lot here. Uh, 
that's just the cover for the aircraft. The fuel to strain the fuel that we put in. Something we need quite a lot of on this trip is brake fluid. And then just oil. It uses about four pints of oil a day. Other than that, there's not a hell of a lot of maintenance we do. How long on average do you spend up in the air on this Rhino capture? Um, well, legally, you're limited to eight hours a day for six days of the week. But sometimes we find that we need the aircraft longer than that. Stop. Out here in the bush, there is so much to contend with, not least the fatigue of men and equipment. Because of the faulty dart, any delay in the truck's arrival will make Clem increasingly uneasy. To move one and a half tons of rhino, Kurtzi encourages his men with the cry, pull my warriors, pull. The situation facing the black rhino in the Zambezi Valley at this stage is not just serious, it is absolutely critical. Unless the situation can be reversed, there probably won't be many black rhino left within two or three years. For lucky number 13, there will be better prospects of survival when it reaches the end of a gruelling cross-country journey to the holding pens. This is a task that could be made much easier and much quicker with more and better equipment. Nothing that Curtsy has is the best that money can buy. This vital last-ditch operation is being run on blood, sweat, and a shoestring. Equipment is always a big problem. We are running with very old vehicles that we have had for many, many years. The old truck that does the recovery from the field has now done something like 250,000 miles. And we are beginning to feel problems that we cannot keep up with in the field. From the moment the rhino was spotted until the moment of its arrival in base camp, has been five hours of exhausting labor. And that's just a morning's work. The problem started well to the north of us and it has slowly come south as the black rana has become almost extinct in various other countries and they are now in Zimbabwe and they will not stop until they have hammered the population until it's not worth coming into the country anymore. When's that kettle gonna boil, Derek? Next week. <laughs> Moments like this are a chance to catch up on gossip. 
Clem and Moxon are good friends and old campaigners. Clem learns that while they've been away chasing Rhino, back at Moxon's home village, those roles have been reversed. You hear what happened? Yeah. He talks barking at night at his village while we've been here. Ringa. Bloody Rhino chased the dogs back into the house. and smashed the house down. But in a, in a car. Yeah. Pocket in and fuzzy film. Mm. In the it's the briefest of tea breaks. Barney O'Hara has already radioed in to report he spotted another rhino. No, negative. We're just loading up darts and then we'll be moving. It's so hot, all the silicone has melted. I think that that's what's causing the plungers to stick because they melt and then and go like no, a glue. It's yeah. got no uh, lubricant there. Yeah. 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 Right, okay. Good job. Two done. <laughs> right now we can stop. Walking from there, we'll leave the vehicle. Okay. This time of the year, the heat is absolutely incredible. It is really a strain on everybody to try and keep going, especially when it gets to around about midday when the ground temperatures in the region of 110 degrees really takes it out of the game. Asked which species of animal is the hardest to capture and move, Clem Kutzi always says it's the one which you happen to be trailing at the time. Screw up. Both of them misses. On this occasion, it's not just the punishing terrain and the predictable perversity of wild animals he has to deal with, but the devil in the machine. The darts have malfunctioned. Just here somewhere we were darted. I heard it hit something. Mm -hmm. It may have been a dart there. Oh, I couldn't see. Okay, we picked up the dart. It's a screw up. Another one. Yeah, I think so. Okay, Barney, the boss says go and let's see if you can find another one. Over. Problems with his ramshackle and second rate equipment are just what Clem can do without. As the poachers' activities have increased, rhino are becoming more and more difficult to find. For someone less determined, such a setback might be an excuse to call off the search. But two rhino a day is the goal he set himself, and two a day is what he'll get if it's humanly possible. Fuck. 
This time, at last, a reward for dogged persistence. Clem has maintained the record that to him is all important, his second capture today. Another skirmish won in the battle against the poacher. There's neither time nor vehicles to complete the journey to the release point, so the recently captured rhino must endure a few days behind bars. And as Clem and Moxon demonstrate, they adapt to confinement very quickly. And still, there's work to do. After all the trouble with the darts, Clem is double-checking everything, determined to find the bug if he possibly can. That's a goodie. Done again. Everything. Now that plunger, <coughs> I left deliberately tight. Right to the end. Yeah, right to the end. I left that one deliberately tight to see if we would could create a malfunction. Yeah. Okay, we'll give it another one, try yeah, and see one. see what happens. We'll try yeah. this time a different battle. Because yeah. we're we'll using the same battle needles, really. the whole time. We'll try a different yeah. needle as well. Yeah. Apart from daily housekeeping chores, top priority every evening goes to inspection and care of equipment. Every tool and vehicle is given the once over. You've got a lot of bugged tubes and tires. Yeah, go and get them. What, when this blowjob in when? <laughs> the alternator's messed. Yeah. The regulator's not working. Clem, how many Land Rovers is together now? There are two and a half that have gone into that one. Even after sunset, when bed most certainly beckons, the old generator keeps sleep at bay just a few hours longer. Far into the sweltering, oppressive, mosquito-ridden night, by the dim yellow light bulbs, routine maintenance continues. It's important that the solitary FN rifle doesn't jam. It's their only answer should they encounter the heavily armed poaching gangs. But it's those capricious darts that still demand Clem's attention. Just how to make sure that tomorrow doesn't bring a rerun of the failures of today. Barney, Doug. Confirm visibility is quite bad. The light's quite bad down here too. Another day, another problem. The weather seems to be changing, and the poor light makes it impossible to spot the rhino from the air. Now Moxon must fall back on his tracking skills. He's noted the rhino's path of flight into the bush, and he scans the ground looking for field signs, or spore as they're called, indications of disturbance that are easily picked up by the trained eye. OK, 
Okay, Bonnie, we're ready to move, and we will be walking into the wind. Okay. Turn, you want us to go on four, or you want us to come study where you are? I've got one fish lying down. I've got one fish lying down. It's a good one. Come left. Okay, I'm going to take my radio off. Don't send a puma. Don't send a puma. Now go. Oh, Jack, did you hear about the crossing? They've just picked up a score of four coaches again. So they're back in again? Yeah, I'm not sure which area, but I think it might be the, uh, the Sarpy Island. That's what it sounded like. Oh, well. The news of the poachers' return to the valley is ominous. So is the weather. Everything in the air says that the long-awaited rains are coming soon. As the clouds gather, the poachers clean their rifles and prepare to step up the slaughter. Already across the river, the Zambian shore is obscured by a veil of rain. OK, Barney, what's that animal doing now? With this sure knowledge, Clem sets off with an even greater sense of urgency, determined to save at least one more animal before the rains finally set in. Well, we've come a couple of k's now. We can hear you. I would say that you're still about a k and a half, two k's from us now. But we have a general direction to move into. I don't know if you've got this big baobab visual that we've just passed now. We're coming down towards uh, a junction of two little gullies with a big baobab. I'll give you another wind check uh, just now, just to make sure. Okay, Bonnie. 
We're just coming through one of those little gullies now. Uh, shit, okay, just hold it. We've picked up spore here. No, negative, negative, not an animal. Looks like a uh, poacher spore, but we're just checking it out now. Just stand by. It's quite fresh, eh? Yeah. Okay, Bonnie, it looks like uh, three people. One has got a horseshoe pattern. Two blokes appear to be barefoot. So just stand by, we'll just uh, check it out and come back to you. Okay, we've also found the fireplace, obviously where, where they cooked lunch. Um, we'll just try and get some sort of age on this uh, pie and I'll come back to you. Yeah. Check, Clem. What have they got? Let it dope dope Another one. Two. Three. Yeah, Three. some more. And another one. Four. Where? Oui? Five. Just have a check there, make sure there's no... So, Is that it, huh? Yeah, it seems to be it. Okay, Barney, we've just also found five uh, MT762 cases, probably fired from a G3. Um, okay, we're just going to sweep on a bit, try and follow the spore, and just see what we come up with. It looks like about four hours. It looks like about four hours. Now I think just stick around and we'll just try and get a direction of spore and then we can decide what to do. We haven't really got the, the uh, weapons to do a follow-up, so once we've decided where they're going and what's happening, we'll have to call in a, a follow-up stick, I think, from the anti-poaching unit. Yeah, Maxa, big and small. Yeah, okay, we'll do. Look. Oh shit, shit, there's a rhino. No, a carcass, carcass. The alternative, only about 100 meters from where the fire was. Um, yeah, it's a young animal. It's only about 16, 17 months old. Um, a young female. Should have still been with its mother. I wonder what the hell's happened to the mother now. Maybe she managed to get away. Okay, yeah, there's shots in the side, the horn's been chopped off, and it looks like they've even cut the bloody spine. Maybe this thing wasn't dead when they shot it and then they walked up to save ammo, they probably bastards. cut the spine just to finish it off. They're getting cheeky, eh? Well, then these blacks are never going to stop. I wonder why they pulled the calf, though. Before the Probably that was the best yeah, shot they the got. Best shot, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's only a young animal. It's a female. She's only about 16, 17 months old. It should still have been with its mother. I wonder what's happened to the, to the mother. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I hope the mother got away. 
Um, I just wanted to, sorry to interrupt you. Why did they um, hack it in the back of the spine? The... I think the reason they've done that is when they arrived here, this animal was still thrashing around and wasn't quite dead. So instead of using another bullet to finish it off, they just smashed the spine. You can see the axe went right through the spine here. So that, that would make sure that it wouldn't be able to get up and do any injury to them, and then they'd just let it die. Why didn't they shoot it? Because, obviously, they, they're worried about the cost of ammunition. ammunition so is expensive. They don't feel a thing. As long as they get the horn, that's all these buggers are worried about, just to get the bloody horn. They don't give a stuff about it. No anything feeling else. for the animal at all. Can you just tell me also why they've used an automatic weapon here? I, I mean, is it a, more effective than uh, a, a sort of soft nose? Well, it's more effective in the sense that you can pull off the whole magazine of 20 within 20 seconds. So if you don't knock the thing down in the first one or two shots, they just keep going until the thing falls over. So that's the advantage of an automatic weapon. And also, they all carry an automatic weapon to defend themselves against the anti-poaching units or anybody from parks that might bump into them. I feel bloody pissed off about the whole scene. Pretty terrible. Especially now, look at the weather coming in, Kim. We're not going to be here for much longer and the anti-poaching units are not going to be operating. So it's just open well, season for the next few months, I think. I feel sorry for the bloody rhino now. Just really it, bad. It's about six months now before we can move back in. Yeah. Right. And who knows what's going to be left by the time we get back at this rate. <laughs> These blacks have obviously got no feeling, eh? Yeah, this is too bad. It's not good at all. It's not good at all. Would you like to catch them, Maxim? I like to kill them. I don't like to take them. I like to kill them. Sebastian? They said you had to kill them all. I don't think we're going to find them. I don't think we can put them in handcuffs. Just we can shoot them. That's a good idea. Where do you think the mother is? Do you think the mother's going to... Well, they probably followed up. Who knows? They would have picked up the spore from here after they'd cut the horn out had their lunch and then got onto the spore, she won't go too far because she'll be worried about her calf anyway. She's going to stop somewhere fairly close. They'll probably catch up with her and she's probably also suffered the same fate. Might the rhino that Barney's got in his sights be the one that's well, the mother? Shit. There's a possibility. There's a possibility that she might have given him the slip. If we can get that one, at least that's one more we've one saved. One more we've saved, yeah. And that's probably going to be the last one looking at the weather, yeah. So this is a pretty depressing conclusion to your capture program. Sure. It's a very depressing conclusion. The only fortunate thing we can say that at least we have moved 70 odd out, which should be fairly safe. Yeah. Every day now in the bonus chipimber in Ifi. We'll have to call in the uh, anti poaching unit. Yeah, affirmative. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right, can get in here. Can get in here. So let's see if we can do it. So we can visit the anti poaching unit in the boat. Bloody bastards, eh? I don't know how we're going to win this. So. They've obviously shot the little one because that was what presented the easiest the best shot. shot. You know, what size horn would that thing would have had? The front horn would be about four inches, the back horn only about an inch and a half. I mean, there's bloody nothing there. No good at it. Rapsat. Okay, Barney, the spore is heading in a northeasterly direction from the carcass.
More melancholy evidence of the poacher's handiwork. Another skull will join the collection that, as it mounts, adds to Clem's anger and frustration. At last, a gleam of sunshine on a thoroughly gloomy day. The mother of the dead baby is alive. How long she stays alive may well depend on Clem's next shot. Any equipment failure now could be her sentence of death, for the killers of her calf may still be nearby. Okay, Dartin. I can see it, it's just moving off now. The rain that's been threatening all day finally falls as it advances Clem and his vehicles must retreat, leaving the rhino to the tender mercies of the invading gunmen. Another couple of storms like this and Clem's operation will be abruptly halted. The earth of the Zambezi Valley, parched and cracked and iron hard, will shortly be a quagmire. Once the airstrip is waterlogged and the tracks are no longer passable, Rhino rescue will cease until the return of the dry weather in three months' time. But rain doesn't deter the poacher. In just 90 days, 
how many more rhino will have perished. No one knows for sure, but at least one a day is a well-informed guess. 90 rhino from the valley's population of perhaps 500 will not survive the rains. At this rate, in less than two years, the world's last great herd will have vanished. Clem has reported finding the carcass. That's all he can do. Now it's up to the anti-poaching unit to search for the culprits. Next from London, there's a bulletin of world news. It's followed by reflections, and then at 08.15, training for tomorrow. <laughs> this is London. Eight hours, Greenwich Mean Time. BBC World Service. The news read by John Stamm. The British Prime Minister has expressed concern that a deal on nuclear weapons between the superpowers could leave Western Europe vulnerable to attack by conventional forces. President Reagan is said to have told his senior advisor that Washington's policy of not doing deals with terrorists remains unchanged. One of Stalin's closest associates, Vyacheslav Molotov, It's on the Zambezi, the frontier with neighbouring Zambia, that Operation Stronghold ceases to be a rescue and becomes a military campaign. Here, a unique war is being waged, a bitter shooting war, with heavy casualties, fought on behalf of an animal. News of the poached rhino carcass has just reached Glenn Tatham, the field commander of the anti-poaching unit. His second-in-command, Blondie Leatham, is a former officer in a crack infantry unit. When he started to work in conservation, Blondie had no idea how important his military training would be. Campaign headquarters is Fort Mana, built by the Smith regime during the independence war. Give me a strike somewhere in the area around that cross. Here, before they respond to the latest carnage, they test and zero in their weapons weapons far less sophisticated than the modern automatics in the hands of the poachers. Glen Tatham's game rangers are the blocking force that hopes to trap the poachers. Their military skills he has good cause to respect. He fought against them in the independence war. Now both sides have come together in this fight against a common enemy. One must continually remind oneself that all these men were employed as conservationists which is how they regard themselves. And yet they've been forced to go to war. If other men had shown similar determination and courage in countries to the north of Zimbabwe, then Operation Stronghold might never have been necessary. But they didn't, and it is. Okay, come from? Yep. Yeah. All right, let's get Though it's called Stronghold, this operation is more of a rearguard action, attempting to police 120 miles of forested riverbank with a mere handful of men and a single plane. With Glen Tatham's game rangers now in position to block the fugitive poachers' escape across the Zambezi, Blondie Leatham commences what in the Vietnam War they used to call reconnaissance by fire, random bursts of gunfire that may flush the poachers out of their hiding place. military tactics may seem inappropriate in what is still basically a conservation effort, 
but the fact remains that this is a war, a guerrilla war where both sides are prepared to kill to achieve their ends. And as in other guerrilla wars, it's the insurgents, the poachers they're pursuing, that have the initiative. As a conservationist, reconciling having to kill someone is not really the crux of the matter. It is just a measure that we are using, or a method that we are using, to achieve our final objective, that is to save the rhino. We'd very much like to stop this killing and hunting tomorrow and get on with the job that we've actually been employed to do, that is manage the wildlife resource of this country. But right now, this is the priority. We are dealing with people who are armed with military weapons. We're talking about AK-47 Russian assault weapons, G3s, which is the NATO automatic weapon, high-powered rifles that will kill an elephant with one shot. A poacher will come into this country now armed with a military weapon with sometimes 200 rounds of ammunition. Well, that's not just to kill animals, that's to kill us as well. You now, we have the situation here where we have a bank of animals that are very, very precious, not only to this nation, but to the world. It's a heritage. And we are the bank managers. We are the agency that have been delegated to protect them. And we have these indiscriminate criminals who have, by their own choosing, decided to take on this bank, if you like. The two captive poachers were equipped with a rifle and soft-nosed 458 rounds. Though soft-nosed is an odd term to describe a bullet designed to explode on impact and cause maximum mutilation, shattering bone and ripping out vital organs. It's the cruelest weapon that poacher John Bander could have chosen for his work. It's easy to feel some sympathy for these men, but bearing in mind that the policy is shoot to kill, Bander and his uncle are lucky to be alive. Moreover, ballistic evidence from the rifle suggests that it's not just Rhino that John Bander's been shooting. He may also face charges of manslaughter. Blondie Leatham takes up the interrogation. You were born in Zambia? Yes, I was born in Zambia. Just ask Moses whether he come, was born in Zambia also. He's also born in Zambia. Now, you've lived your whole life in Zambia? Yes, sir. OK. Who first approached you? Who first came to you and asked you to come and hunt rhino? For this trip. No, in the beginning, when you first started. George Zulu. Now, who supplied you with the ammunition? Who gave you the, the bullets? The same man who gave us the machine, John. Now, do you know that it is illegal to come over into Zimbabwe and hunt with a rifle? For sure, sir. It's illegal. Do you know that you can get killed? For sure. But you still did it. You still came. When did you first cross into Zimbabwe from Zambia to come and shoot rhino? We came here on the 5th of? of September. Of September? Yes. How many rhino did you shoot? Two. Two? Yes. Now, why didn't you shoot them in Zambia? Why don't you shoot rhino in Zambia rather than come to Zimbabwe and shoot them? I was being told by my employers, do you go to Zimbabwe? And it was not my wishes, I was being sent. Now, why do they send you to Zimbabwe when they could hunt rhino in Zambia. Why don't they hunt in Zambia? I don't understand why they send you to Zimbabwe where you might die. Uh, that much I didn't know him, he knows better. But have you heard that they're rhinos? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I heard that they were rhinos sometimes, but now they are not found. But why aren't they found? They have been cleared. They have been cleared? Cleared. Killed? Cleared yeah, out? Yeah, yes. Finished? I think. By who? By people. By people from where? Zambia. So you are telling me that the Zambians have cleaned the rhino out in Zambia there. That's why you're coming to Zimbabwe. That's why they send you to Zimbabwe. Sure, sir. OK. Now, the person who's in charge of you, John, does he work for someone else or is he the boss? He's the boss. He's working under the government. He works under the government? Yes. Do you know what department he works for? I just heard that he is under Minister of Water Affairs. Water Affairs in Lusaka? In Lusaka, yes. OK, now, your national parks, why aren't they patrolling the Zambezi to try and arrest you before you come over? Yeah, if they have found somebody in the national park, huh? now, if that particular person have got money, huh? then he gives those people, collapse them, then he just leaves them. 
and I've heard this in occasion in several times. You find that oh, yeah, somebody was arrested, but he's free. Somebody was arrested, he's free. How come then? So it's when we understand that there is what? A lot of corruption. Colla corruption. Corruption. Within the Zambian law enforcing agencies, in other words, within the Zambian national parks and the police, both have got corruption in them. Uh, nearly everywhere. Ma. Nearly everywhere. Mm -hmm. Nearly everywhere, not only the department, I mean in the government. Nearly everywhere. Nearly everywhere. Mm -hmm. How do you know how to shoot? I was once in a city control. You were in Teti control in Zambia? Yes. So you worked for the government? For sometimes back. <clears throat> you did work as a hunter in Teti department in Zambia? Yes. Now, this is your second time to come in and hunt rhino? Yes, yes, sir. Now, when you first came in, what type of rifle did you use? G3. A G3? Yes. It was a bugger, it was broken. You've come before with a G3 automatic rifle? Yes. What other weapons do they use that you know of? 375. They use 375. Yes. And? And the 458. Why is it that so many people have got weapons in Zambia, enough to come over here and hunt rhino? And we capture the weapons and they just come back with more weapons. How, how do they get all those weapons? Are there a lot of weapons that you could, if you had money, you could buy them? Ah, that much I don't know. It's simply because of these big shots, my collapses. It's where I think they are getting all these things. Just because of corruption, they just get them? Sure. Without license? For big shots. For big shots. Mm. We are really killing and arresting people that are what we would call a bottle washer, someone who's been put up because of money, and he's really just selling his life. But we want those in the middle structure of this crime syndicate, the mafia, if you like, of Africa, to stand up and take cognizance of the fact that we will continue unabated and even more determined as time goes on to seek and destroy these people. So that whenever the middleman, who is an entrepreneur who remains untouchable, we cannot, I cannot go, for example, into Lusaka, wherever these people are based, and uh, make some aggressive approach to him. He is the untouchable. But we want to make it as difficult as we can to him indirectly for him to find people that will come across onto our side of the river armed and shoot rhino for him. He may be a businessman who wears a three-piece suit and is not going to come here and face the harsh African bush felt. And certainly he knows in himself that when he comes across this river that he stands a good chance of being killed. So he's not going to come here. But he sets up some poor peasant has certain hunting skills, who may have hunted in Zambia in previous years. Um, but therein lies a deterrent. And uh, indications are that they're starting to feel the pinch. For example, let's take a situation that happened recently. A gang of nine poachers crossed into this country. We went to them very early. We then did all the normal tactics, which I won't obviously divulge here, of seeking out these people. We then pushed them to the river. We caught them as they were about to cross. They'd already killed six rhinos. We shot and killed two of that gang. The remainder escaped. But uh, we also, we, apart from killing two of the poachers, we did capture one AK-47 rifle, which is almost a new rifle, nearly brand new. We also retrieved all the horn. So that our man, our middleman, wherever he's based, ended up with a zero, a red in his book, if you like. And now that must infuriate him. And we want him to feel that. Um, you know, I dream about these people. I wonder what they look like. Because really, that's the guy that we want, desperately. We have now killed 18 people. 18 people have lost their lives. I think that's awful. It's terrible that we have to do this. So we want that guy, internationally, nationally. We should seek him out, expose him, and take whatever measures is necessary. If, obviously, he put up a fight, wherever they happen to be, he would stand to lose his life. En route to deliver the captive poachers to the CID, Blondie Leatham drops in on Clem Kutsi, a final visit before striking camp and leaving the valley till the next dry season. Well, thanks. Good morning. Well, 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 so how's it going? What have you got here? I've got these two pipes that we rest the other day. I have to take them through to um, CID in Chinoy. Is that the whip? Yeah. Let's have a look at it. Four, five, eight, eh? Madara, yeah. eh? A bit very rusty, but still a killer. Do the job. Yeah. yeah. They've obviously cashed it, buried it somewhere. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Mm. How many rounds do you have with it? 11. 
or soft softeners. A single bullet for this rifle costs the equivalent of a week's wages in Zambia. But then a poacher can expect a month's wages for just one day's hunting. 40 quite to one round. 40 is that what they pay? That's what they're yes. playing black market. Yes. Interesting. That's the guy there. Can you speak English? Yes, sir. I think I'm going to put you in with the rhino in the pen. But not with your 458. Just with your bare hands. And see if you can kill it then. If you get in there, you can have the horn. No, can't you do it? Yeah, you can. I'll give you a knife. No. I'll put you in. You can have both horns. <coughs> The words of the song celebrate their imminent return to homes and families, a prospect that makes it just a little easier to abandon the valley and its beleaguered rhino. For the final rhino captured, another dose of tranquilizer before the last stage of the journey to its place of safety. You've got a real prize on that. Come on, Mop. This pole's new stuff to shit. This one's loose under my knackers as well. She was dozing.
Let's go stick, Lucy. So I can try this mama quickly. Well, bring me the rope. Get away. Go see your car. It is important to understand that Zimbabwe's policy of translocation has nothing in common with what is happening in East Africa. There, notably in Kenya, substantial funds have been put into schemes to confine about a hundred black rhino behind fences in game parks and private ranches that will be little more than zoos. No! Go away! No! Get away, you silly old thing! Huh? Hey, what do you think you're doing? Huh? You're free, you idiot. Here in Zimbabwe, rhino are being released in great tracts of wilderness, where already Clem Kutsi, under-equipped and underfunded though he is, has established the largest refuge herd of black rhino surviving in the wild. Surely, this achievement deserves more generous worldwide support. For this is not one man's war. It's not just Zimbabwe's war, and if it's lost, we are all the losers. This is the last wild herd of black rhino on earth. In one particular park in Kenya where there were an estimated 500 rhino, they're down to 20 now. And for that reason, in Kenya, they've now embarked upon what I would term a last ditch exercise, and that's to capture known living rhino and put them into a fence. It's just a glorified zoo, if you like, and have them under heavily armed guard to try and at least get them to breed up again to where they can be reintroduced into areas formerly where they, where they formerly existed. Now, to us, we just don't want to get to that. You know, if it ever gets to that, then certainly we would have failed in that first dimension. Undoubtedly, we would have failed. So, again, the appeal is look to the south. Um, we're not judging anybody to the north of us, but the indictment is there. It has failed. And we don't want to do a last exercise here. Before that situation happens, let's get to grips with the situation and with the, uh, with the circumstances as they are, and let's save something that is still viable and has a chance. <laughs> Saving the black rhino has become symbolic of the conservation effort movement in Africa. Although we have been specifically dealing with one species, uh, that is the black rhino, there is one very important aspect of this whole conservation movement in Africa. And that is that the conservation movement has 
for all intents and purposes, really failed. And once the black rhino is gone, then what's the next species? Well, in terms of value, it would be the African elephant. Once the African elephant is gone, then what next? And considering that the rhino and the elephant require vast tracts of land to be able to survive naturally, one then starts to ask the question, well, once the rhino and elephant have gone, then why keep such vast tracts of land when there's such tremendous human pressure for lands? The human population dynamics clearly indicate that. So that's the black rhino, salvation of the black rhino, is symbolic now of whether we fail or succeed. And I would just like to stress this point, that we must save the rhino. And then, obviously, a bonus would be then the elephant. And in the shadow of those two species lies the whole, if you like, long-term conservation of our natural heritage here in Africa. Amen. Uh -huh.